Good morning. Good morning. With a quorum being present, I am calling to order the curriculum, curriculum Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Today is Friday, January 18th. And since this is a new committee, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the committee members. Um, I am Lisa Mack, the chair, Ms. Cheryl Pasteur, the vice chair, and Mr. Rod McMillian. And we have Dr. McComas um, from staff. Um, the informational summary which describes the committee's last meeting has been provided. It does not require committee approval. Um, I will ask Dr. McComas if there are any changes or updates to the agenda. There are presently no, there are no changes or updates to the agenda. Okay, hearing no, Dr. McComas, would you lead us through the first item on the agenda? My pleasure. Um, so our first item of business today is um, a curriculum committee orientation and overview as this is our first assembling of this new current committee. Um, I invite Ms. Shea to come forward and um, we'll walk through an orientation overview. So again, uh, welcome new committee members. Uh, our staff, this is our favorite committee of the board, <laughs> I have to confess, uh, because this, this is the committee that really gets at the sort of the deep work of teaching and learning day in and day out. So good morning. Um, as Dr. McComas said, I'm Megan Shea. I'm the Executive Director of Academics. Um, and so I think Dr. McComas is going to start by just kind of um, going over the agenda of this presentation, but I just want to echo that this is, um, especially for the work that I do, this committee feels like the one that most touches the heart of the classroom mm -hmm. and teaching and learning, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present today. Yes. So what we'd like to do in this brief segment is to just provide um, all of you an opportunity to kind of uh, look at what is the work of the curriculum committee. Um, and we appreciate that you've signed up and dedicate your, your time uh, to this particular service. Um, and so we will do um, an overview of the responsibilities of this committee. Uh, we'll introduce you to the different departments of curriculum and instruction. Um, and then we will do an overview of, of BCPS curriculum and then we will move directly into um, the second agenda item which is approval of curriculum courses and phase forms we thought it was important for you to have an overview of curriculum um, and what that is in BCPS what it looks like um, and give you examples of that um, prior to us getting into some of the curriculum work Okay, and um, another point of just information. So the curriculum committee's uh, primary work, and, and you can find it in the board handbook on page um, 17 of the board handbook. It's very short and sweet. Um, primarily reviews current, new, and or revised curriculum courses and programs that support instruction, um, and reviews instructional materials that are selected for procurement. So we in this committee do not um, look at contract exhibits and we don't analyze the methods of procurement and all that, all that is done in the procurement committee. Uh, what we do is look at the qualitative, what, what is the resources being brought forward, why uh, are they important, um, how will we be using them, how is the professional learning to support implementation, just to kind of give you an overview of what this work is. Um, and then also on the dates, I know we have the um, previously established dates for the uh, committee meeting. I do recall, I think there may be one that needs to be adjusted. Uh, I have a conflict on May 19th. Okay, and then we can um, look at um, schedules and adjust that at a later date if we so choose to as, uh, as the committee uh, chooses to. Okay, and then what you have before you is the organizational chart of uh, curriculum instruction. Um, and so you'll see that I have um, the pleasure and, and really honor of leading curriculum instruction. Um, and then my direct staff you'll see below is Ms. Uh, Megan Shea, who's sitting at the table. Um, she is our interim executive director of academics, and that is the office that um, primarily our content offices report to. Then you'll also see Dr. Melissa Wistead, Dr. Wistead is waving um, and she is the executive director of academic services and academic services is where we have um, special education title one offices our ESOL office as well as our um, office to support advanced academics did I capture everything 
Oh, yes, thank you. And college and career readiness service. Um, and then you'll also see uh, Ryan Imbrielli, Executive Director of Innovative Learning, and he's waving right now. And in his office, we have um, educational options, which is where we have magnet programs, we have our um, extended year program for students, we have our extended day program for students, uh, we have home and hospital, uh, we also have the Office of, of Blended Learning, and that encompasses things that include maker learning and library media as well. And then you'll also notice Dr. Renard Adams, who was unable to join us this morning. Um, he is the interim executive, um, senior executive director, and he really oversees curriculum operations and supports all three of the departments within the division. Uh, Ms. Gypsy Cox to my right is uh, our administrative assistant, and Denise Frock, who isn't with us today, is the fiscal officer for the division. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, sorry. Well, if you could get yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, what I really wanted to illustrate for everyone here is when you think about these three offices, you know, the classroom really sits at the intersection of the work of all three of these offices. When you think about the content area, the services, again, thinking about students that are gifted and talented, students that have special needs, students that are English learners, and then all of the resources that come with. Um, innovative uh, learning. Rather, that's a student who perhaps our traditional school setting isn't working for them and they need to recover credits through our extended year program, or perhaps you have a student who has medical needs that they're not able to be in the traditional classroom and they're in home and hospital, um, or f um, perhaps for disciplinary reasons, they're on e-learning. Um, so again, we want to kind of show you the intersectionality of these three departments and how they come together uh, to support students and all of the diverse needs of 114,000 young people. Okay, thank you. So with that, I'm going to begin kind of at the beginning, um, because when we talk about curriculum, um, we thought it really important, especially with a new group, that we really go back to the basics in terms of when we say curriculum, what do we mean? Um, because that has changed as in terms of how we've evolved to meet the needs of our teachers and our students in the 21st century. Um, so we're going to begin with the guiding question of what is curriculum? And so it starts with our foundation is in policy and rule 6000. And so in that board policy 6000, and there is this statement which talks about how um, the board recognizes that curriculum is the foundation, that the foundation of our educational program is that system-wide curriculum designed instructor designed and structured so that our students can experience high academic achievement and continuous growth. And so um, we really use that as thinking in terms of that idea of a foundation, but then also want to be sure that we build in opportunities because we serve a very diverse population of students in 175 school centers and programs. Um, in our curriculum development handbook, we further go on to define curriculum as a specific blueprint for learning that is derived from content and performance standards. Curriculum is articulated and coordinated across content areas and grade levels. Um, that's particularly important to think about the differences in elementary school where you may have one teacher teaching multiple different content areas and that's really organized by grade level. Whereas when you get into our middle and high schools, that's more organized by content because then the um, students have different teachers based on that specialization. So I'm going to piggyback off this idea of a blueprint and I'm going to use the analogy of a roadmap um, because I think that that will serve us to understand how we envision curriculum um, to be both a stable foundation for all of our teachers and students but also to allow the responsiveness and flexibility that's necessary to serve our students. Um, and so if you, if you can bear with me with this analogy of a roadmap, um, I also wanted to share this idea that we do use a framework for a curriculum design. Um, it comes from Understanding by Design, which is by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie. This Understanding by Design um, is based on stages of backward design. So um, what that means is in stage one, we start by identifying what are the desired results? What is it that we want our students to know and be able to do? Um, and that reflects the language in the policy that talks about identifying those outcomes driven by standards. Stage two then is once we've identified those desired outcomes, how will we determine that we've made it? What would be acceptable evidence that we would know our students had in fact met those outcomes? So that's the next stage of curriculum design. And then the third stage of curriculum design 
is to identify in stage three, what are the learning experiences, um, lessons and instruction that's gonna help all of our students meet that. Um, so I'm gonna now continue in each of those stages and go a little more deeply into what that looks like um, in terms of how we design and structure our curriculum. Um, so following along that idea of a roadmap, stage one is where we identify desired results. So the question that we ask is, what should students know, understand, and be able to do as a result of this unit of instruction? So if you think about out, um, many of us, maybe even this morning because of weather, um, using Google Maps, we start by identifying where are we going. And that's indicated by that little red blob <laughs> on your map, on your GPS. And so that's the same way we start curriculum design. Where are we going? What is the outcome that we want? And so for us, in our unit of study, we focus on standards, either the state or national standards. So as I go into more specifics, because today we're also going to be talking about mathematics, I'm going to use math as a lens, but know that the design framework itself is true for all of the content areas. And so in terms of math, we start with, in each unit, what are the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards? And so as you may know, back in 2010, as a state, we shifted um, to what used to be known as the Common Core, um, but what we call the College and Career Ready Standards. Um, those in mathematics, that also came with what we call the Standards of Mathematical Practice. These standards of mathematical practice are the behaviors, or what we define as the mathematical literacy skills and strategies that are then overlaid on all of the different standards that students need to understand. As part of stage one in defining what is it that our students need to know and be able to do, we also identify essential questions. What is gonna be driving this unit of study as a unit of exploration for students? With that come this idea of big ideas or enduring understandings. And so it's important that we elevate the instruction in a unit of study so that it isn't dependent on this particular problem happens to be about floor tiles. Well, we're not necessarily just teaching floor tiles. We're trying to think about what's the big idea or enduring understanding that we want students to take with them long after that one task or lesson is over. And so with that, we also identify what are those essential skills and knowledge that all of our students need to know. So when we design curriculum, this is the first stage. We have to identify all of these pieces to be able to identify our desired outcome. Once we know where we're going, the next step in stage two is determine acceptable evidence. How will we know that we've made it? How will our students demonstrate for us that they have in fact reached that intended outcome? So if you think of that analogy, you know that when you're following Google Maps, you get a, a lovely message that says you have arrived at your destination. So in curriculum design, our stage two is how will we know that our students have arrived? And the way that we design that in curriculum is through our summative unit assessments that are aligned to those target standards. So what is that assessment? assessment going to look like that we're going to use to measure how students did. The next bullet success criteria, we co-construct this with students and teachers. So in other words, we engage students in a conversation of how will you demonstrate for me that you've done a good job at meeting this target. And then to help teachers supporting that scoring of those assessments, we also design in curriculum rubrics so that we can have some standard of acceptable evidence serving across 175 school centers and programs. So we've identified our target or where we're going. We know what it'll look like when we've arrived. The next stage then is to figure out what are the different pathways that students and teachers can follow to get there. Jeremy, I'm not clicking. Could you help me perchance? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> There we go, thank you so much. Um, so stage three is really about planning those learning experiences instruction. What are the learning experiences, resources, and strategies that will best support all of our students in meeting those intended outcomes? And so I have there an inset of, again, following that analogy of a roadmap, you'll know that oftentimes when you enter in your destination, you're provided with different routes that you could take depending on traffic, depending on weather, depending on a number of different variables. The same is true for our teachers. We present them with a number of different routes of how they can help their students based on the students they serve in their class in any given day, in any given year, in any given building. And so to that end, we identify in curriculum and produce sample and model lessons or lesson seeds. We also identify core and supplemental resources and materials. We identify formative assessments. So what are those checks for understanding so we don't wait all the way until the end of a unit of instruction to be able to take the pulse of where our students are. 
We also identify opportunities for enrichment for students who may need additional scaffolds or support, but also where are the um, opportunities for acceleration for maybe our students who are ready to do more than what we've identified as that target. In mathematics in particular, um, new curriculum development that we've been working on to address those needs specifically are what we call tiered tasks. So when we've identified a college and career ready standard, what are the different tiers that students might need to be able to meet that target? Th this is where teachers really become architects. And so really we empower our teachers to be able to design effective instruction based on the needs of their students. We trust our teachers as experts to make those decisions. But from a curriculum standpoint, we want to make sure that we've provided them with enough resources and materials aligned to those identified target outcomes and standards and that acceptable evidence to ensure that whichever pathway they need to take for students, they all are able to meet that intended goal or outcome. And so in Baltimore County, one of the main major shifts that we've been making is about how are we accessing this curriculum for our teachers. And one of the exciting things about having our digital ecosystem in BCPS1 is that curriculum is able to be dynamic in real time. Um, I will share with you, when I first started teaching, um, I had a binder that was about this big. It was mass produced once <laughs> and, and shipped out in a box in schools, and then that was it. And sometimes I would get an update a year from now if I were lucky. Um, but having it in a digital ecosystem allows us as curriculum offices to be responsive um, and to be dynamic. And so BCBS1 is that digital ecosystem where our teachers access curriculum. Um, and as you may know, last year um, we made the move to a new learning management system called Schoology. And so Schoology is where all of our curriculum documents um, are housed for teachers to access, but it's also where our students interact with um, different lessons and materials that their teachers can provide. Once teachers enter into Schoology, the curriculum is organized in groups. And if you remember back in, you know, seven slides ago when we first identified curriculum, these groups are organized either by content in the secondary areas, so it might be secondary language arts or secondary mathematics, or in the elementary grade levels, they would be organized by grade level. And that's to support teachers so that if I'm a fourth grade teacher, I don't have to go multiple places. I can access my math, science, English all in one place. And so when teachers log into Schoology, they will see um, their curriculum groups organized similarly to what you see here. Now this is a screenshot of my groups. And so because I am the executive director, I have all the different content areas. A teacher would have just those groups that they had joined for their curriculum. I'm gonna ask, um, oh, is he already over there? Hi, Mr. Yes. Embriali. Okay, so once the teachers go into their curriculum, um, group, they will, so this is an example of a fourth grade curriculum group. So you can see we've color coded folders by content area. Um, so for the purposes of today, we're now going to shift, and this is actually a live um, view. Mr. Embriali is going to help me by clicking. So he is now live in Schoology, and you can see the yellow folder is where a fourth grade teacher would access their mathematics curriculum. Once we open that curriculum folder, you'll see up at the top, we've identified some year long planning resources to support teachers. You have in your folder an example of um, one of these documents in the broadest sense is called a year at a glance. It's also important to note that this year at a glance, so this is um, the broadest view, if you will, of mathematics curriculum. So this is a, a year in the life of fourth grade math. And some of what I've referenced before in that stage one and stage two is captured in this year at a glance. So you'll see the desired outcomes, you'll see the essential questions, um, those essential skills and knowledge, but you'll also see some of those assessments. It's important to note, because I know as you work with different stakeholders, you will also get this question. This year at a glance, is also available on our public facing website so that parents, um, different community members that want to say, well, what is it that we're teaching in fourth grade math? This is available for them as well. Um, so when teachers are in Schoology and accessing their curriculum, that's the broadest example. So they start the year really looking at that long range plan of that year at a glance. Then underneath that, as Mr. Ambriali scrolls down, you'll see there are some additional resources for teachers, but then you'll start to see a folder structure by unit. So if Mr. Ambriali would click on unit one for me, thank you.
You also have in your folder a printed example of a unit overview for mathematics. So this is the next layer for teachers. So as I mentioned before in stage one and stage two, not only do we align curriculum to target standards, but then a part of the work that we do in curriculum design is how are we grouping these standards together and then planning that stage three, those different experiences to help all of our students to meet that target. The printed copy of what I gave you is just an example of the unit overview, but you'll note, um, I'm sure as you look through those pages, you'll see multiple opportunities in blue representing hyperlinks. So within the digital ecosystem of BCPS1, um, we have linked a plethora of resources and documents for teachers um, to support them in planning those experiences um, for, for their students. If I can direct your attention back to Schoology, then what you'll see in Unit 1, um, as Mr. Embriali, it scrolls down, you will see all the different lessons, um, lots of different resources for teachers and students. This is what we earlier defined as Stage 3. And so I wanted you to have somewhat of a sense of the scope of what we mean by curriculum. Um, it is not one textbook. It is instead um, that really um, detailed roadmap for teachers and students, um, beginning again with that broad view of that year at a glance and then moving through into units and then all the way down to the individual lessons. So I'm going to breathe <laughs> and then ask you if you have any um, questions for me in particular about um, just the basics of curriculum. So I know that I walked you through a specific example in math, um, but that understanding by design, those three stages, the Schoology organization, that's consistent across all the different content areas. I do have a question. Yes. Um, I see here on the mathematics grade four year at a glance. Uh -huh that for place value, adding and subtracting, um, the duration is 24 days. Mm -hmm. What happens when children don't achieve the mastery that they need to achieve within those 24 days? Because as I read through here, I would imagine the teacher's moving on to unit two that has 36 days. And what I most often hear from teachers and parents mm -hmm. is, we are moving kids forward to get to that next lesson, whether they know what they need to know to be successful in the next lesson. So what is our strategy around that? It's a great question. And, and um, so there's a couple of things that we put in place structurally. So first is that if you um, do the math when you go through all the different allotted days, it's not a one for one. So in other words, we don't write days so that we have 180 days of instruction and 180 days of curriculum. And that's intentional to build in some of that flexibility for teachers so that they have room um, for students that require that remediation, but also that require acceleration, but also because we know that there's a lot that happens in schools. There are assemblies, there are field trips, et cetera. Um, so we do try to design some room in terms of the days on the calendar or, or instruction versus lessons to provide that opportunity. The second piece that we put in place, um, and we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the other resources we've put in place to support teachers is this idea of long-range planning and unit planning. And so um, we start unit planning with our teachers with this idea of taking the assessment themselves and then identifying, knowing their students where are areas of struggle that we might need to build in additional lessons um, so that students have that opportunity for reteaching or in many cases pre-teaching so that we can front load. Um, thirdly, we have an instructional model in mathematics that really um, requires whole group instruction, but also opportunities for customized small group instruction. So that's the opportunity in the classroom for teachers to provide differentiation for students um, so that we have those opportunities to compact um, curriculum so that we can give students that need it additional time while also enriching students that maybe are ready to move on to the opposite piece. Um, it's not it, it's not um, a silver bullet in terms of, it, it is the work of teaching, that you have a variety of students that have um, needs, but we try to support through curriculum by giving teachers and students as many different resources as we can, um, focused on the major work of that grade. So you brought up place value. The other piece that's important with the year at a glance and the unit overviews is to help teachers and, and students understand that place value comes back. So in other words, we don't necessarily 
need to freeze here in unit one or unit two, um, but instead we need to help teachers see opportunities of where place value will come up again because the standards that I mentioned are year-long standards. In other words, the college and career ready standards identify what's my expectation for a third grade student at the end of the year, not necessarily at the end of a unit. So we don't necessarily expect mastery within those 26 days, um, but rather it's about helping teachers and students understand what is it that I've demonstrated to this point, and then what can I come back when it shows up again in unit three or unit four that I can then build in as part of that small group instruction to support students. But what, what I have observed personally as a volunteer in a classroom mm -hmm. is that because there are children of such wide degrees of ability within a classroom, and I'll, I'll speak specifically, um, I think the classroom where I most volunteered, there were a core group of kids who were somewhere on the third grade spectrum. It was a third grade classroom. There were about four kids who were way above that and then there were five kids who hadn't even learned what they needed to learn in kindergarten mm -hmm. so how do we expect one teacher no matter how good he or she is to meet the diverse needs of those kids with concepts that are outlined here right and, and again, I don't have a simple answer because that is the work. That, that, and and the, you're um, describing a situation that happens in classrooms every day. Um, from a curriculum standpoint, the way that we support teachers, there's a lot of different strategies. Um, part of it, and, and part of it in the budget request, you heard us talking about school-based math resource teachers to try to support teachers with that, both to provide that kind of push in support. Um, we work a lot with school-based math resource teachers, um, stat teachers, um, sometimes paraeducators, depending on the staffing of the building, to try to support teachers because we know that sometimes we have students that need that specialized instruction and that is a part of that vision for that budget request because we know that that's an ongoing need. Um, in some schools, they work to regroup children across different grade levels and so we support that during unit planning as well so that those um, so it may be that when we get to unit two, I have pre-assessment information that tells me this group of students would benefit from being with this teacher. Um, so we do try to support teachers in regrouping across classrooms. Um, and again, as part of that planning, um, the more we can do in terms of long range planning and unit planning, um, because teachers know that the students that you just described, um, that will be the case in unit two and unit three and unit four. Exactly. And so we also try to work, um, we'll come again later in the presentation to talk about our model of support. Um, so in curriculum instruction, we have in mathematics um, resource teachers. And so part of the design of the support is we have had resource teachers go out to model and co-teach and support teachers um, in making those kinds of instructional decisions. And um, because it is a lot and, and teaching is hard and you and, and I certainly would never over by to say, oh, you know, we can just do this. So there's a lot of different ways that we approach that, um, much of which comes from ensuring that teachers have as many resources as they can um, and that we provide that ongoing professional learning and coaching to help them make those kinds of instructional decisions. I think Ms. Pestier has a sure. question or a comment. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think the, the questions uh, that Ms. Mack just asked are certainly on point. Um, coming out of a school mm -hmm. on all of the levels. Uh, my concern goes to some of those things about which you just spoke, beginning with the kind of professional development mm -hmm. that the classroom teacher gets, uh, because often I've found that the teacher does not know or does not recognize sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, how to or where to uh, uh, get that help or that support or when to turn over a particular child or children. And as we also process uh, inclusion, mm -hmm. so you will often have students in a classroom, not just by ability level, but also by their special needs, that we may have a para or someone there who can come in and offer that support. But again, I go back to the idea of professional development because that para and I know personally that sometimes the paras that we put in are not necessarily equipped, you know, to, to give some of the supports that the students might need. Um, so now we're talking about staffing 
and budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, and now with our new uh, calendar, we are eliminating some days when people could have had mm -hmm. professional development opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that is of concern because I agree with Dr. McComas. This is the center. Mm -hmm. None of the rest matters if we don't do this correct. So you are, in my world, the most important people well, on you. earth. Um, <laughs> and, and for real. Right. So what do we do? Where yeah. are we going when we w want to really zoom in and not just about the rhetoric of it, which is good conversation, sure. but the reality yep. of how we help our children at all levels? Let me, Ms. Shea, let me join Please. in. So one part of the process, and I, I do want us to be mindful of our time because it is 1131, um, is that at a school level as well, Ms. Mack, and I know Ms. Pasteur and Mr. McMillian, you may speak to this certainly as well, you know, as a classroom teacher, as you said, you're every group of people, no matter what the setting, even in an advanced academic, if in, in my AP classes I taught as a high school teacher, I had a range of capacities and, and skill gaps and, and giftedness. Um, there are also other processes in a school that support tiers of intervention uh, for students. So when you think about uh, those students, and uh, forgive me because I do have a tendency to think about our students who are struggling um, uh, in terms of response to intervention. If we have a student, let's take a student who is in fourth grade, they're struggling um, to meet their reading requirements, and it's clear that they're currently performing at, let's say, a first grade standard. But we know it's it's urgent for us to get them to the end of fourth grade as quickly as possible to try to get them back on track. Um, schools have processes called student support teams where they come together in an interdisciplinary team model where you will have the teacher, you may have a special educator, you may have their school reading specialist, um, a school administrator, um, and depending upon what other resources a school has, and they come together to look at what is happening with that student and identify what might be those additional layers of support and intervention for the student and for the teacher? I think in theory that sounds wonderful, but the reality in the schools that I've spent time, the kids that you're describing are the norm, not the exception, and the resources are not there to meet all of those children's needs. And quite honestly, the example that you give for me begs the question, how did the child who's only reading on a first grade level get to the fourth grade? Well, Ms. Beck, I certainly understand what you're saying because I have served in schools where students persistently struggle to meet standards, and I would tell you that there is a complex, um, there's a complex, um, uh, the word's escaping me, ingredients, if you will, that go into a student. I'll take my own daughter, for example. One of my own children is dyslexic, and as a first grader, she was not reading on first grade by the end of first grade. Um, and it really had to do with her cognitive neurology. Her neurodiversity was a, a limitation that was not reflective of the school's capacity. It was a physical, developmental uh, challenge. Um, and so I use her as an example because she is my own child and I can use that. Um, and so um, there are a lot of contributing factors, that's the variables is the word I was looking for. There's a lot of complex variables and factors that go into getting a child where they need to be. Um, and so when we talk about resources, certainly we are always asking for additional manpower. You saw that in our budget request. Um, we're always looking for that next resource that's going to meet the, a particular child's needs. So uh, I, I certainly am not going to argue with you that uh, the, the need for resources and supports are, are persistent. And the more complexity and challenges a student faces in their life for whatever reason, um, that comes into the classroom as well and adds to our need to have a wide array of resources, both material and human. Just um, one last thing, um, because the reality was mine as a principal, department chair, and a teacher that everything that has been said is so. We've certainly done um, SSTs, but the reality comes back to uh, staffing. And I just, I want to say without having spoken to the other people on, from the board, um, and I see Ms. Causey sitting out there, that the board needs to be 
your first line cheerleaders um, when we talk about staffing and how we staff and needs that are already present in the school because many times we left the SST and it was the same thing and and we do need to offer that support uh, because it does not always happen. We can follow all of the processes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, we make a difference. And as a board, we really must embrace what you're doing so that uh, our children are getting what they need and those who are teaching them um, get that. And as uh, Dr. McComas just said, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're doing AP or, or whatever the level is, you're going to find mm -hmm. that divergent um, uh, population. And also keeping in mind that because you're in AP or GT does not mean you don't have special mm -hmm. needs, sure. special education needs. And so we have to we have to be cognizant of that. And so we need to, as a board, be very cognizant of what's going on in our schools first and foremost. I just needed to say that as someone who on every level has seen it, done it, and it doesn't, as Ms. Mack said, necessarily mesh. Mm -hmm. The thing that I take from it is the importance of the teacher. Absolutely. It's the quality. You know, we've got to get the best teachers we can. Absolutely. And I'm an advocate of the staffing piece. You know, it's about the teacher and what the teacher can get to. And, and I want to say later on, you know, I was the kind of guy that strayed from the curriculum, and I did it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I have some concerns on how we evaluate a guy like me right. and my kids, because I might not have, you know, because I strayed from it, you know, I, my kids might not have met those standards. Uh, and I was kind of allowed to do that uh, for, for a number of different reasons. But, you know, so, the so, central piece of it is the teacher for me. Well, and, and I couldn't agree more that teachers are the most important part of this. And our job is to support teachers the best that we can um, through a variety of ways. You mentioned some of the challenges we do have with professional learning when the calendar shifts. So we try to be creative and think of other ways that we can use. Um, as Mr. Imbriali was scrolling, we also build into the curriculum professional resources. Um, and I also want to go back to your comment about strain, because I have this conversation a lot with teachers. I like to think of it as empowering teachers as professionals to know their children what we want to try to ensure though is that we have some non-negotiables that are that foundation so that it's not dependent on you got lucky or based on your zip code but that we have a basic foundation that all third grade students or um, algebra one students have and then we empower our teachers to have that art of teaching to do what they know best to know their students and, and to be empowered to make those decisions um, I always tell teachers I don't want people to think my job is not curriculum police. My job is to give them the most solid foundation aligned to those standards and then give them the training and supports that they need so that they can, because the variable that I don't have that changes every year, every day are the students. And so um, I think that that is all a part of the relationship of what we try to do as a CNI division to support that in the classroom. If I just may add, um, and certainly Mr. McMillian, you know, master teachers do often stray from the curriculum because they have the skill to do that. They understand the rigor of what they're teaching, and they typically have vast experience, as you do in your case with 25 years, I know at least at your last assignment, where you have 25 years of working with diverse students, knowing how do you, okay, I've seen this example of a learner before, I can use this strategy to help them get to that next level of performance, um, often new teachers tend to walk very closely with the curriculum because they're developing those skills. Um, as a principal, I had, uh, again, j just as any group, an array of faculty. Um, I had master teachers who were getting their kids to those standards, and they had the, the capacity because it really does, teacher capacity is uh, phenomenally important in, in student learning and achievement. I had uh, teachers who were new, who, who very much needed that resource to be solid. Uh, so 
as they were developing their capacity as teachers. And I had teachers who needed support, who maybe did well in some areas and struggled in, in other areas with getting their students to a, uh, a standard. So uh, keep in mind that Again, our curriculum serves as sort of that foundation, if you will, of um, guidance and direction to help teachers develop those master skills. I too, as a, a teacher, began very closely with the curriculum as I became more uh, adept and experienced in my area of teaching. I too started to add in my own creative aspects to the curriculum and, and led my students as I became more of a of a professional in the area. So I ask that we keep that in mind as well. Okay, just for the sake of the group, it is 1141. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then do you want me to move on to the next portion? Are we okay? We're moving on? Okay. Um, I think, um, Jeremy, could you switch back to the PowerPoint? Right. If so, it's not clicking again, I'm sorry. So while they are uh, getting set up, we are now moving on to the next agenda item, which is our curriculum phase forms. We did bring this um, presentation forward as an information presentation with the previous committee. I think it was their very last meeting. Mm -hmm. So this is where we as a group left off, mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to bring that back to you because um, ultimately this would um, need to come forward at the full board sometime in the spring because this has direct impact on our summer curriculum writing workshops as well. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, as Dr. McComas said, um, we um, each year um, report on what are the new courses that are being developed and I'll walk you through some specific examples of what would um, sort of spark the need to develop a new course um, and then we do also have opportunity on occasion to remove courses for a couple of different reasons as well. Um, you have I believe in your folders um, a packet that looks like this that talks about the phase forms so I'm just going to try to capture some of the highlights um, especially in some of the new courses because I think it's um, very exciting. Um, so you'll see um, lots of new courses in um, CTE as part of our opportunities that we try to provide for our students. We are continuously um, growing and building to try to support that idea of workforce development and ensure all of our students have that gift with purchase that our superintendent speaks of. Um, you'll see in particular we have new courses um, under the Pro Start, um, which is about food service and the hospitality industry. It's one of the fastest growing areas when we work with our um, CTE Advisory Committee and the P21 Governor's Task Force, we are always looking at what are industries that um, will help our students to be able to provide for that. Um, to that end, we also, you'll see CTE course around um, apprenticeships. So this is an opportunity for students to have uh, one year of related classroom instruction prior to um, participating in a three credit internship, apprenticeship, excuse me. We have a new course request um, titled Principles of Aviation and Aerospace. Um, this came from a CTE grant funding that we were able to um, secure, and this is going to um, allow us to um, begin a course about aviation engineering practices um, and unmanned aircraft systems, which um, are us lay people call drones. Um, so this is an opportunity for our students to engage in learning um, that as well. Um, we also have, um, as part of our, you've heard, I'm sure, in part of the board presentations around our PTEC, the Pathways and Technology Early College High School, that we have our first cohorts at Dundalk High School. So we have some new courses there as we continue to build out that program for our students um, over at Dundalk in partnership with CCBC. In ELA, we have a few new courses um, in creative writing. We've added a course to allow students to continue this um, in the advanced academics pathway. So we have students that we've had creative writing um, for a number of years, sorry. Um, and so this is allowing us to extend that pathway and aligning it to standards of AP English, um, language, literature, and composition courses. Um, in the middle school, we're adding a theater elective. Um, and this is, again, so students have an opportunity to engage in the exploration of the Maryland Fine Arts Standards for Theater at the middle school level um, so that they can use that as part of their decision about pathways they may pursue in high school. Um, you've heard a lot recently about our ESOL population and how it 
continues to grow. So in response to that, we have opportunities to create a course in high school, um, ESOL level five. Um, this is for students who um, may have not yet met the criteria for exiting ESOL um, or who enter high school at a level four proficiency. Um, this really lines up with research, which says it may take anywhere from five to seven years for students to acquire the level of English proficiency we want for them to be successful for college and career, so this allows us to continue that pathway. Um, we have a new course in, for Jazz Ensemble, again, extending it to GT to allow us to continue. Um, they, uh, students in Jazz Ensemble, we currently have two Jazz Ensemble offerings, but this is allowing us to expand on that opportunity for students that want to continue um, with that course of study. The next two classes in music and dance um, are about um, sequencing courses in music and audio technology. Um, so this is really neat. This is an opportunity for our students, our 21st century learners, to study advanced elements of mixing and sound design, composition, using digital tools. Um, that's both for design and production and then also recording and marketing. Um, we, hear, we hear from students often where they talk to us about, um, you have to teach me how to do this for a living. right? I want to be able to turn my passion into a career, and so this is along that pathway. Um, we have a new course um, called Dance for Athletes. Um, this is a course that would allow some of our student athletes to earn a fine arts elective class um, while engaging in um, a course of study to talk about developing strength, flexibility, and agility um, to support them. This was actually really popular with students. We currently have um, a full credit course, so this is allowing us to offer it as a half credit opportunity for students. Um, in science, we recently transitioned to the next generation science standards, and so um, we are offering a new course um, entitled um, Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS, Contemporary Problems. Um, this is an elective course um, where students are able to engage in solving contemporary problems um, aligned to science and those core disciplinary ideas and cross-cutting practices in engineering. In social studies, um, we have redesigned our courses at the middle school level. Um, and this is aligned to the C3 framework in social studies. So I mentioned sometimes we have an opportunity to design new courses when we have that far to know that I'm behind. Um, <laughs> um, in social studies, we sometimes have a, an occasion to have um, new standards or new assessments will often spark the need to design new courses. Um, so this is about exploring aspects of history through time periods. So you'll see the grade six world history and world history for advanced academics or GT covers through the fall of Rome and then grade seven picks up there and goes through the Renaissance. Um, in addition, we also have um, two, three classes that are for the law and public policy magnet programs that are currently offered at Towson High School and um, Eastern Tech has their first cohort in ninth grade. So we have international law, constitutional law, and then civil and criminal trials. Um, interestingly enough too, um, when we talk about um, connecting these law classes with um, supplementing American government, which is a high school required assessment. In world languages, um, we are developing coursework in partnership with CCBC to develop courses in American Sign Language. We're really excited about these courses. We've heard um, in particular for a number of stakeholders, and Ms. Mack, you mentioned some students who are striving readers. Um, it can be challenging, particularly for students with dyslexia, to learn a second language as well. And so this will allow students to meet the world languages requirement um, in a different way. Um, we're also really excited about the potential um, that this course pathway eventually could lead to certification um, to be employed as an interpreter, a sign interpreter. So we're really excited about that new pathway opportunity. Um, again, in world languages, you'll see that we're expanding offerings um, in Chinese, French moving into the international baccalaureate courses, and Spanish for native speakers. All of these advanced courses are designed to help our students earn the Maryland Seal of Biliteracy, which is a new initiative at the state um, that really talks about mastery at very high levels of proficiency of a world language. So we've got a lot going on in terms of new courses. We do have occasion sometimes to change names of courses, so you'll see um, some of those represented as well. Um, name change courses um, are sometimes because we are changing the level. So we have some courses, for example, several CTE courses as part of, again, the Governor's Task um, Workforce Development Task Force recommendation to have our CTE courses at an honors level. So we've been working to revise those course expectations and change the names accordingly. 
accordingly. Um, in music and dance, we've had some um, name changes. Um, we used to have courses that were titled men's chorus and women's chorus that were really aligned to gender roles. Um, this name change is actually going to change it to align to the voice levels or the parts rather than gender. So instead of being men's chorus or women's chorus, they would be named tenor bass chorus and treble chorus. Um, and then um, we do also have occasion um, to sometimes terminate courses. And many of the terminations that you'll see is because we have a new course that's replacing it. Um, so for example, um, in CTE, when we talk about um, increasing the level of honors, we would then terminate the course level that was written at the standard level. Um, we sometimes terminate courses if it's no longer recognized as a current program of study. Um, so for example, we used to, in MSDE, have a program um, within cosmetology for a nails license. So we had some courses aligned to that. MSDE no longer recognizes that program. So that would be a course of study that would not lead to industry certification. Um, and then we also have a termination um, in the social studies because we've replaced those courses. Um, and then finally, the ESOL, we used to have a separate class, ESOL American Government, um, but because American Government is that high school required course, um, instead what we are doing is um, providing supports for our English learners in American Government courses um, rather than having a separate course because we thought it important that it meet the same level of standards. I know I spoke fast, but I think we're over time. So do, does anyone have any questions about this? I just have this? a very quick question. Sure. I, I presume that not all of these offerings um, are at all schools because Correct. not all schools have food service programs. Correct. Um, so it's implied that so in the course registration guide, it does identify. I can give you some specifics. Um, so for example, the aviation technology program um, will be implemented at Hereford High School, Kenwood High School, okay. and Randallstown. OK, that, I, that, that's what I thought. So yeah, there so is a guide that shows where Correct. It in the course registration guide, it would identify where in particular. Thank you very yep. much. But some of these courses are across the county. So some of the social studies courses or the music classes, those would be offered at any comprehensive high school. Is there a way in the future when we look at these to have a column that shows sure. the schools or Absolutely. whether it's system-wide? Absolutely. OK, thank you. I sure. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. My uh, pleasure. Ms. Pasteur, Mr. McMillian, any questions or concerns? Okay, so was it unanimous? We just need it for the minutes. We need to take the, <laughs> take the vote, <laughs> or three. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you, Heather. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. And um, we are moving on to mathematics and BCPS. So we, Ms. Shea will be staying with us. And then I think uh, Dr. Brown is coming forward to join as well. Are you guys, okay. Okay, so I will go ahead and get started. So what we'll be doing here today is sharing with you sort of our mathematics achievement and our, our um, really our rationale for bringing forward the request for an audit um, from an outside um, resource. So if we could go to the next slide. And so today what we're going to look at is why now, why math, and why an audit, and then have opportunity to both answer the questions that you have previously submitted and to also field new questions. So one of the first things I want us to take a moment to look at and think about is the shift in math um, expectations from when we were in school and um, previous standards to our current standards for students. Um, and so to that end, I want you to think back to when you took math classes. You may remember that you had lots of formulas that you had to plug in the numbers and follow the operation, and out came your answer. You may have had the challenging word problem that we all remember. 
Um, and that much of their earlier um, approaches to mathematics were really about um, operational um, skills and uh, computational skills as opposed to necessarily mathematical reasoning. Um, and so there are some of the big differences between the old standards that many of us are familiar with, um, whether it was our children or perhaps um, as teachers, or even perhaps when you think back to your own experience as a math student. Uh, today, our standards, our college and career standards, really are focused on getting our students to not only have that operational fluency in terms of computation, Computation, but to also be able to uh, demonstrate both in writing, mathematically in formulas, as well as in written language, their mathematical reasoning, why they've selected which algorithm or formula to solve a particular problem, and to be able to reason through it and critique other students' work. And so I'm going to ask that you keep that in mind as we move forward. I and, could and keep so to going. illustrate that, <laughs> yep, I could keep going. And so to illustrate that, you have in your packet um, mm -hmm. some math problems that we're going to um, walk through this morning. If you look at the first one, yep. And so as Dr. McComas said, this is really designed to illustrate the shifts that we've been talking about. We talk a lot about how the expectations have shifted, but we wanted to take an opportunity to really illustrate this in a very concrete way um, in the nature of mathematics. So on the first page, you will see um, an assessment item that was aligned to our previous standards. So if you would just take a moment and read just this first uh, math problem. So this first problem really is reliant, as um, Dr. McCombs was saying, on some pretty concrete skills. If you know the formula for perimeter, you can solve this problem. And you can solve the problem and all um, have the exact same answer. There's one right answer. It's pretty concrete. And knowing that formula enables you to solve this problem. So it really relies on that idea of rote memorization um, and, and knowledge of the formula. Please, if you could, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just want to point out that up in the corner, you're going to see it says MSA. So this is an example of the old standards, OK, of what our students would have needed to demonstrate. Thank so you, So if you would go to the um, second page, you will see an example um, that is aligned to the college and career ready standards um, that have been previously measured by PARC and will be measured by the new MCAP assessment as well. So I'm going to ask you to take a few moments to read this problem. And so what hopefully is apparent is that this is really increasing the level of rigor and cognitive demand. Um, it's important to note we haven't changed the formula for perimeter and area, and so knowledge of that skill is still going to be important. But as you look through this problem, you can see that the formula alone will not enable a student to be successful because the standard has changed. That is not enough anymore to demonstrate that level of success. Instead, students have to explain their reasoning. They have to use their knowledge of perimeter and area as a foundational skill, but to apply it to a multi-step problem, um, adding in this idea of a second calculation of cost, they also need to explain and justify their reasoning. And what's critically important to note is that there are multiple correct answers. And so it does allow for that divergence of thinking, but it's going to require that students have a much deeper understanding of conceptually of what it is that the problem that they're trying to solve, but then also have the literacy skills in mathematics to be able to explain their thinking and justify their reasoning with that solid mathematical evidence. This is really illustrative of the shift in the standards that we're working on. Um, this next task, the last task, um, I'm going to ask you to take a look at. Um, this is an example of a practice item from the current SAT. So what you may know is that the SAT recently underwent a redesign of its own because the standards have changed. And, and just to read 
standards changed because universities and the workforce told us they needed to. They told us that we had to shift our expectations of what our students had to be able to demonstrate to be successful, um, just to kind of give a little history. And so what's readily apparent when you look at this SAT, first of all, is um, the need, our, our superintendent's vision of literacy and how critically important. There's a lot of reading um, that needs to take place and a lot of deep comprehension and critical thinking. Um, in this case, the formula is even given to the students, so it's not relying on that rote memorization, but rather that application and that ability to justify with evidence and reasoning the thinking. And, and so we share that by way of illustrating um, why math, because math and math really has shifted in terms of the expectations of our students, in terms of what it means to be successful, in terms of the types of skills, the reasoning, critical thinking within mathematics that our students will need to demonstrate to be deemed ready for college and ultimately for career. If I, sorry, button. Uh, if I may add, when you look at the SAT and even the sixth grade park, I, I ask that you also just pause for a moment and think about our students with special needs. Again, I'll go back to my own daughter. She's a junior. We have been fussing a great deal at home about the SAT because she does not want to take it um, um, because of the literacy demands, and she is phenomenal in mathematics. But but think about those challenges for those students. Think about our students who are English learners, some of whom may have been with us multiple years and have acquired some proficiency. We also have students who enter in our ESOL program in our schools at age 16, 15, 17, and may have very limited English proficiency as well. So I just ask you to think about what that looks like in 3D for some of our students as well. Um, Oh, where'd Ms. Shega? She's coming back. Oh, <laughs> She's coming back. okay. Um, thank you. I just again want to. I want you to understand what our students have to be able to demonstrate and perform at when we look at student achievement. So, uh, speaking of student achievement, moving on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting getting back to the why on this, uh, we're going to look at multiple measures. We'll look at Park. We'll look at Map, and we'll also look at the SAT. And across these measures, I think you're going to see a pattern with the scores um, that points to a need to reevaluate our, our curriculum. And again, across these measures, uh, in comparison to ELA, students are performing significantly lower on the mathematics measures relative to the English language arts measures. Well, I'm on. But. Jeremy? Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so looking at uh, elementary school uh, for starters in grades three through five, uh, you'll see a downward pattern in our, generally a downward pattern in our math scores um, across these grades. Um, this pattern also carries on MAP. So if we look at NWA, we see a very similar pattern uh, on the MAP scores as well. Moving to middle school, uh, grades six through eight, uh, we pulled out the MAP data separately from the PARC data for a reason. Uh, we know that MAP and PARC are highly correlated to one another, but in middle school, uh, the NWA assessment, the MAP assessment, is our only um, census administration. That is, it's the only test that's given to all students. Uh, by the time you get to seventh and eighth grade, a, a sizable portion of the student population is taking Algebra one. So when we look at seventh grade park scores or eighth grade park uh, scores, it doesn't represent all students, whereas MAP does. Unfortunately, when we look at our MAP data, you see that there's a downward trend across grades six, seven, and eight uh, throughout this window of time. Uh, again, pointing to a need to, to improve things. We go to park again, um, you see a similar pattern, even though, again, it's not a full uh, representation of all students. Grade six, largely representative of the whole population. We do have a small set of students who take Algebra 1 and do quite well. Grade 7, we have roughly about 20% of the population takes Algebra 1. And grade 8 is roughly 40% of the population taking Algebra 1. And again, uh, the pattern there points to a need to, to look at the curriculum and look at what's being done. And I would interject at this point that um, when we think about curriculum, we think about what is, uh, again, the foundation for all students across the system. Uh, within any classroom, uh, as Ms. Mack pointed out, you've got variability within a classroom, and we certainly have variability across schools. But when we look across all schools and all students, we see a downward trend in our data that is concerning. Mm -hmm.
going on to Algebra 1, you see the breakout here. We've, we've teased out the different grades. Uh, those students who, who are really advanced and are taking Algebra 1 in sixth grade do very, very well. Uh, we see there are seventh grade students, again, uh, on an advanced pathway, uh, do quite well with it. But our overall performance, um, average performance for Algebra 1 is below that of the state and substantially below uh, the average performance for uh, students who take Park uh, ELA in 10th grade. So, uh, and we see here, and I think probably the most concerning piece is that students who make it to high school, uh, having not uh, taken Algebra 1, who are on, on a more traditional pathway through uh, algebra and advanced mathematics really do quite poorly uh, on the park exam, again, pointing to this. So perhaps it's not much of a surprise then that when we look at our SAT data, we actually see a downward trend in our SAT data as well, where the, the uh, SAT performance in mathematics in particular ha has really uh, dropped significantly, uh, uh, much more so than what we've seen in, in ELA. So. So what you have before you here is a slide that I presented to the full board on September 25th, uh, 2018, um, as part of our annual student achievement report to the board. Um, and in that, we, uh, throughout the presentation, talked about uh, we talked about ELA and what we're doing to uh, improve ELA. We talked about math and what are we doing to improve mathematics. Um, and what you have before here is really um, an illustration that our work to improve our performance in math um, and to serve our students better and support our teachers better is really multi-pronged. It's multi-layered. Um, there isn't a single solution to this. Um, and so I'll begin um, in the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, the section labeled curriculum. Um, we acknowledged um, in that September um, achievement report that we believe that we need to really take a critical eye to our curriculum um, to ensure, because we know that that's a fundamental resource that our teachers use as a guide to teaching the standards uh, and working with our students. Uh, and so we identified that we wanted to bring in an external person or um, vendor, if you will, to come and help us critically examine that curriculum. Uh, we know our curriculum is written by our teachers and is written for our teachers, and our math office participates in that process. And so it is difficult to have a critical editing eye uh, or analytical eye to your own uh, work. Additionally, in terms of instruction, you know, a curriculum has the written curriculum, there's the taught curriculum, and then there's the assessed curriculum. And all the calibration of the three of those lining up well um, is important. And so we have in the instructional aspect, which is the implemented curriculum. And that's really, as we spoke earlier, where our teachers bring into um, the teaching and learning process, their expertise, their agility, uh, their ability to um, help recognize what students need when they need it, um, and both helping to fill in gaps as well as to challenge and accelerate students who are ready for that, um, and meet the needs of students who are moving forward on pace. And so one of the primary ways that we support daily instruction is really through instructional coaching in addition to the curriculum. And so this year we redesigned how we utilize our content resource teachers. So we have, um, we're fortunate to have a number of resource teachers in both the math and ELA content offices. And those resource teachers spend the entire school year uh, primarily out in schools working directly with teachers uh, every day in terms of teaching and planning. So the change that we went to this year, what we previously used to do is resource teachers worked um, almost in a, I, I know Ms. Shea has used the expression concierge service, if you will. Um, it, it really worked that a principal, a department chair, a teacher would say, I need help with, and let's say I'm a new teacher and I'm de developing my school around guided reading. I need help with understanding how to select text for my various guided reading groups. Could someone come and help coach me on that? Um, what we've moved to this year is resident, uh, to a residency model where a resource teacher is assigned to a particular school and works with that school for three consecutive weeks and has the opportunity uh, 
to work to sync in with the team of teachers, whether that's a grade level team if it's the elementary or if it's a department at the secondary, identify what are some of the instructional um, areas that we, we need support and professional growth in. They spend that time there working with the teachers in collaborative planning, analyzing student work samples uh, as a data analysis method to help identify next steps in instruction. They can go in and, and help um, model instruction and even co-teach teach where a teacher is learning some skills. I'll use the example of guided reading. While my background was a high school uh, social studies teacher, I had an opportunity in my career at one point to be a principal of an elementary school and, and learning how to lead guided reading groups and recognize that in a group of 25 students, I may have four different reading levels and how to pull that and work with the, the challenge text to get those students where they need to be. Um, and then moving on into assessment. We know that we not only have this large scale um, assessment that Dr. Brown shared with us, but underneath that rest our unit assessments, and underneath that rest our everyday formative assessments, where a teacher is looking at samples of student work. They're kind of taking those dipstick measurements throughout uh, the teaching and learning process to, to gauge, is Mary staying on track with me? Is Mary struggling? Maybe Mary's so far ahead that I got to really think differently about the, the work I'm assigning her or challenging her with. Um, and that really working part of our residency uh, resource teachers are helping our teachers look at what are those like micro measures along the way that help us make adjustments and that is is part of our approach this year and then ultimately professional learning uh, kind of across the board so if you will much of the everyday professional, the most important professional learning I find is often job embedded, right? People in real time doing their work and having a coach with them. And that's really our way of reaching directly into classrooms. In addition to that, we have department chairs at the secondary level that we're able to work with each month to provide professional learning. And then they go back and can help uh, their departments, um, rather that's in a department meeting or depending upon um, how their school has organized that opportunity for them to work with their colleagues, um, as well as assistant principals and principals. And we have the opportunity to do professional development each month with our principals. Um, so you can sort of see it's a, a multi uh, range uh, of levels of professional development that we provide in an ongoing process. I, again, I could keep going because it's my thing. <laughs> Uh, and what we have before you here is, um, I know that there was, um, wanted to know how that we have an operational action plan that, you know, every year just as schools look at how can we do better, our offices look at how can we do better. So we have a math action plan that is our operational plan. Um, and we do have input on that. And we look at a wide array of uh, factors that help us develop that. And what you see here certainly is some of the the um, quantitative uh, data pieces, as uh, Dr. Brown had highlighted earlier. And then we, of course, look at our curriculum-based assessments, which were those unit assessments, um, as well as observation of teaching and learning, uh, the whole range of school leadership. Uh, I, myself, and my whole team goes into schools as often as we can to directly see instruction, to see how the curriculum is being implemented, uh, see where our students are struggling, and see where our teachers are either choosing to use our curriculum or choosing not to use our curriculum, and then talking to them about um, what, how, what's going into their decision making so we can understand uh, how to improve the resources that we provide them. Um, teacher feedback sessions, I know Ms. Shea can speak to this, but we offer, we engage our teachers in feedback around curriculum almost continuously, and it comes out in a wide variety of ways. Rather, they're in collaborative sessions with our resource teachers. Rather, they're in the monthly department chair meetings. Rather than when we're doing school visits, rather it's me and my team or the community superintendents, the executive directors, as they're doing school visits. Um, we also have um, feedback sessions and scheduled dates, and we also provide um, survey opportunity. A teacher can email us at any time about um, parts of the curriculum, and they do, um, and we take that feedback into consideration. And then additionally, this year, um, because we are trying to 
do better and um, make more of a concerted effort because what we had been doing clearly had not been producing a result. Um, we have decided that each month since we have the principles in one place, we pull together a group of principles specifically to help us hone in and advise us on math. Many of those principles themselves were mathematics teachers and were certified um, math mathematics teachers. What you have here is really just a visual to capture how I think about our operational math plan. So when you think about, um, I want to point and teach, right? <laughs> so if you look at the systemic actions, there are the things that we're doing to try to support things across 174 schools and programs. Um, one of the first things I was um, able to do that our superintendent support me in is really changing the leadership in our mathematics office. Our leadership had been in place for almost a decade, um, and it was clear that we needed some fresh thinking and fresh uh, eyes on our math math um, resources, uh, and so I was supported and the board approved uh, a new director actually just, I think, in the last, right before the holiday, I think it was, um, and our new director was able to just start right after the winter break. Um, and then to look with a very critical eye at the curriculum that has been developed and that has been in place so that um, we can see anew what is right and what needs to be fixed. Um, we established the administrative focus group, which we meet with them every month um, to help us make sure that what we're doing is uh, right for schools and right for classrooms. Our residency teacher model, uh, again, that spans across the system, professional learning, as I mentioned, and um, budget development. All of you saw that we have been, we brought forward a request to um, see if we could get math resource teachers that would be school-based, so they would live at schools. In my uh, mindset, that math, uh, resource teacher that we're requesting really would be a parallel to a reading specialist. The state of Maryland doesn't offer a math specialist um, certification like they do for reading specialist at the elementary level, um, but we wanted to have pre-positioned at schools a math specialist who could be that um, primary support around helping teachers analyze student work samples, uh, look at um, assessment data, help identify appropriate tiers of intervention, that they could work directly with small groups of kids, they could pull out, they could push in, and they could co-plan and also co-teach with teachers. Um, so that was put forward in the budget development. When, we, th when we, we start closing that microscope and we start thinking about school-based actions, we know one of the key things is we need to be in math, cl excuse me, math classrooms constantly seeing how things are going because we know that making real-time uh, time adjustments is what will yield a better result. But that means we need to have more eyes focused on actually what's happening so that we are able to identify where we need to shift our practice. And then lastly, we know at the classroom where our students struggle the most, whether we're looking at unit assessments, daily assignments or um, broad assessments. We know that our students not only need to have rock solid computational fluency as all of us, you know, you knew your math facts and you, you had to have them without taking time uh, so that you could get on to more complex mathematical work. Mathematical literacy, examples of what we mean by that, when you think about that sixth grade park example, you think about that SAT example, it is not merely just having those math facts and knowing, okay, I, here's the formula, I need to just plug them in and out pops the answer, but it's really about having a depth of reasoning and, and having strong literacy skills that help, help you sort through the real world context um, and then know how to solve it in multi-step fashion. And so that's really sort of what we are focusing on when we're looking at student work samples and how we're building students, scaffolding student skill step by step so that they can get up to that level of rigor because it is a demanding rigor. Okay, I'll, again, I'll pull and back. So, um, <laughs> okay. In this um, slide, this actually takes the Mathematic Action Plan and gives you some of the more specifics. So Dr. McComb has walked you through a broad view of um, the approach. Um, we essentially used four different buckets, if you will, to organize this action plan. The first is the curriculum bucket. And so I um, earlier today spoke to you about the depth and breadth of the curriculum. We're talking about thousands and thousands of um, pages of resources. And so um, part of that shift in the 
the curriculum, as Dr. McCombus mentioned, was around leading that, but this um, audit request is about helping us to understand, are we meeting the level of rigor? When I talked before about the stages, we identify the stage one is our target is the standard. Have we met the standard and what we even expect or put in front of students? Um, before, when you had an opportunity to engage in looking at those math items and understanding the shifts for students, it's important to understand that that's been a shift for teachers as well. And so as part of that curriculum, um, we want to not only have this audit help us to identify um, whether or not we have done a good job of providing that solid foundation, but then we do also, as Dr. McComb has said, as part of our plan, make schoolhouse visits and engage teachers and principals and students um, in giving us feedback in real time around curriculum. Um, I, I know the superintendent mentioned recently at the board meeting, um, audits don't fix things, right? It's, the, it's what we do with it, but this is a key first step to help us um, so that we can um, focus our efforts, that we um, go down the path that's going to be the most likely likely to result in reaching those optimal results we mentioned before. Um, in instruction, um, as Dr. McComas mentioned, it's also about implementation. Ms. Mack, you've referenced being in classrooms in real time. That's where it really matters. What's actually happening in the classroom and, and how are we supporting teachers? Um, and Ms. Pesture also mentioned the challenges with professional learning. So how are we providing it in a variety of ways? Um, how are we building teacher capacity? When you shift the expectations, um, if the teacher preparation has not caught up to the those shifts. Many of our teachers, our brand new teachers, are coming into classrooms and have not had the sufficient preparation they need from a content, um, pedagogy, and application standpoint to be prepared to serve our kids. Um, and so we want to talk about the written and the implemented curriculum. And as Mr. McMillian pointed out before, when teachers make a decision to do something differently, engaging in that conversation, I don't want the reason to be because our curriculum wasn't enough. I want it to, because, to be because they were doing something more um, or engaging with their students. But I want them to trust that they have that solid foundation that they're working for. Um, assessment, we want to help our school-based administrators and our teachers use the data. Um, we don't want to add more testing. We want to be able to use the tests that we have to actually drive decisions for students. Um, so we want to help our teachers and our principals understand how to make sense of what we learn from those assessment opportunities, um, but also to have those smaller checks for understanding, taking that pulse along the way. And then the last bucket really is about intervention. We know that we have considerable work to do to help our students that are striving in mathematics. Um, because as you mentioned before, I know Ms. Mack, you talked about students that are several years behind and how does that happen? It doesn't happen in just one moment. It happens over time and it's almost like compounding interest. And then the challenge is you need students that are striving the most to make more than a year's growth. Mm -hmm. Accelerating growth is really challenging. When you have a student who comes in third grade grade and is two years behind, they haven't made a year's growth yet in a year's time, and now we need them to make two and three years growth. Mm -hmm. That is a challenge for students and teachers um, and students' families. So uh, a portion of the Mathematics Action Plan is about what do we need to do to provide those intervention um, strategies for teachers in real time, um, professional learning for how to do that, but then also um, what are the resources they need and the models of instruction um, so that we can maximize maximize that time for our students. And so um, the last question was, um, why an audit? Um, and some of the questions that I know we're going to go through question by question is also about understanding why do we need help? Why do we need to go outside to do this? Part of it that we were um, illustrating before is just the sheer volume of what we're talking about. Um, curriculum is more than just a, a small binder or an individual book. Um, it is deep, um, and it is um, a lot of resources and materials and lessons. Um, it also was written by us. And in the same way that it's um, not reasonable to ask us, you know, I, um, as a former English teacher, my students would say, I check my work five times, and they don't see it. You can't see it in your own work because you see what you think you wrote. And so we need that fresh set of eyes to help us see this is what we intended. Tell us if we met the target. Before I talked about how in curriculum design we start by setting outcomes, Dr. Brown shared that our data 
data is telling us we are not meeting the outcomes that we want for our students. And so we are looking for help to be able to put real action steps in place to do to change that, to disrupt that pattern for our students. Um, and in terms of asking our teachers themselves, we do get a lot of input for teachers, but a third grade teacher is in the best place to give us feedback on the third grade math curriculum. A third grade teacher is not going to be able to give us feedback on an Algebra 1 curriculum. And so to have all different teachers at all different grade levels give us all different feedback would make it a challenge for us to have a systemic focus of priorities. We're looking for one voice and one set of expertise to show us in the scope of our coursework how are we doing towards providing a sound curriculum, again, as part of our board policy definition that is our foundation, so that all of the other steps we've identified, it's not the only step, it's just a first step to helping us make really strategic choices about how we focus our manpower um, and our efforts to provide that solid foundation for all of our kids. Okay, so um, I know you have a lot of questions, and I know we have questions that we received both on January 4th and January 7th. So what I like to ask Ms. Mack, only um, with the interest of time, what we were planning on doing was going through those questions much like we did at that, uh, I'm not sure that any of you were present, the contracts committee where we said here's the question, here's, here's the answer, or do you want to jump to the kind of real-time questions because I don't know your work schedule. Um, I want to make sure that we do what we need to do. Okay, are we good? Okay, very good. All right, very good. Then we'll begin with the January 4th questions. Excuse me, Doc. I, yes. I don't, I don't need to go through those questions question by question. That I, did, did anybody else submit questions? I received questions January 7th that had come through Ms. Causey. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not aware of those questions. Okay. So if we could go. You want me to go right to those? I shared my questions with the committee members. Okay. I am not aware of this January 7th question. Okay. So we'll go ahead then just move directly to the set that we received on January 7th. Okay. So uh, these questions, uh, let's see, the first one, uh, during the discussion the board asked about previous math reviews, it was mentioned that there were links available. Uh, when are those links going to be provided to the board? And those links were provided to you in the December 21st uh, weekly update. They were the links that shared the Montgomery County Public Schools, did I say the right district? Montgomery and Baltimore uh, City. And Baltimore City. Okay, the second one was uh, Dr. Brown discussed the student performance measures presentation that was provided to the board on 925, 18, which I too have referenced and shared one of uh, my slides around math. Um, please have him send uh, documentation. This should include tables of data from all individual schools. Presentation only shows total averages and the board needs to see all data from all schools, both so, lighthouse and non-lighthouse. Yeah, in regard to that, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's variability within a classroom for students, um, and there clearly is variability across the system in, in terms of schools. Um, and I think one of the questions you pose sort of juxtapose Woodlawn and, and Catonsville mm -hmm. as, as an example. Um, when we look across the system, par part of the reason we use um, averages for the systems, again, we're looking at the base curriculum across the system and how is it serving our students on the whole. If on the whole, students in mathematics are doing more poorly than students in ELA, it points to a systematic problem across schools. Um, and when we see trends that are downward over time, again, it points to a systematic problem across schools um, over and above the variance that we see within schools. Um, in terms of, of availability of data, one of the things that um, I pride myself on is, is our team's work to make data available to our community. Uh, and I'm really proud of our superintendent and working uh, to make our system and the data available for our system in, a, in an incredibly transparent way. So we have dashboards available to the community that show performance on map as well as park. Uh, we actually have greater data transparency than any other system in the state of Maryland. Uh, there are a couple systems that are trying now to adopt uh, some of the practices that we have. It would be impractical for me to get up here and go through 174 schools, <laughs> uh, schools programs and centers and talk about them and to try to make an inference about performance across to all of those, um, particularly grade by subject. Again, this is why we look at 
the overall pattern of data. Uh, but certainly that data is available both to the board and to the community in those dashboards. Can I just address that point? Sure. Um, I went to a dashboard presentation um, at the Southwest Area Council put on, mm -hmm. and I came from a background of data yeah. and specifically asked the question that if we, the board, needed to run a query for the schools in our individual districts that shows both math and ELA proficiency at a school level that we could indeed get that, that SQL could be written to provide that data. So is that, is that your understanding that that is available? I mean, I know it's there because yes. I pull it up on an individual level, but it's not time efficient for us as board members to pull up our individual schools when I know by running a query that just includes a factor of district number, the data is there for us to get it for each one of our districts. So there are a couple ways that they, that can be done. Absolutely, you know, queries can be written to pull data. My preference, frankly, is to build that into the dashboard uh, to be able to query the data in a, in a way that somebody can actually just touch the dashboard, click on a on a um, drop down and select. We tend to do that by region now. Um, but my again, my preference I think would be just to build that straight into the dashboard. Just to build in district one through seven into the, I mean, I don't really yeah. care how we get it, but I think for us as board members, um, we, we need to, you don't, you can't know where you're going unless you know where you are. Mm -hmm. And it's very time consuming the way it is today for us to know where our schools are. So I appreciate that feedback and we'll, we'll take a peek at that. I, I do know, for example, if you go to um, the dashboards around uh, organizational effectiveness where we can look at enrollment patterns, it's pretty easy to click a, a group of schools and look at a cluster that way. Um, and again, zones are woven into that already as, as a filtering. So I, I think I'd rather just uh, try to build that in so that you guys can, However we can fish get it, whenever I, you yeah, want. <laughs> I, I don't want to tell you how to do it. Yeah. I just t I need to tell you that we need it. That makes sense. And, and again, I'll go back to the team to talk about how, how we can uh, incorporate that in as a part of how we display data to the community as a whole. Right. Okay. That's fine. And I may be, th there may be parents within a community who want to say or want to know how does my school compare to other schools within this district mm -hmm. or within this zip code. And it would make it easier if they could filter within a, a region like that. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. And then Dr. McComas, to all of the points you made, first of all, I would just like to say I appreciate the effort that's been put into this. Um, uh, you did respond to my questions that I submitted on the 4th, and I'll be very candid and tell you what I still struggle with. We are a big system. Mm -hmm. When we look at the performance, um, I'll just keep it to the math performance. It's not like the math performance suddenly dropped. Agreed. It has not been good for years. So I question coming from an environment where we had to look at our outliers on an almost daily basis and address them, how did we get to the point where we're trying to put out this fire mm -hmm. of very, very poor math proficiency levels? Um, and I, that's a rhetorical question mm -hmm. um, because I don't think the answer is going to help solve the problem. Um, what I question is, have we tried to look outside of the box for other ways of getting the data without spending a half a million dollars. And where I'm going with that is we know that um, Montgomery County had the same audit that is being requested here. Mm -hmm. I pulled a copy of the entire report um, and obviously I don't have the insider knowledge for every school in Baltimore County, but there are a lot of similarities within that executive summary that I hear from teachers and principals. Um, I've been hearing for the whole year that I was running um, for this seat that are already addressed in their report. Have we thought about reaching out to them and seeing if we could leverage the curriculum changes they made? Um, I went online last night to look. Um, we'll just stick with math again. So. Um, 
We're at 39.4% in elementary school for proficiency. Montgomery County is at 51.1%. Mm -hmm. We're at 26% for middle school. They're at 44.4%. And we're at 40.1% for um, high school. And they're at 56.2%. Those are sig significant differences. Mm -hmm. Um, people often say, well, they're a different type of school system than we are. They have 161,546 students. They're bigger than we are. They have a growing Hispanic population, which I often hear is um, impacting our results here in Baltimore County. And in the interest of using money wisely, you know, why wouldn't we reach out to them, see if we can leverage their curriculum, see if we can leverage their best practices. Um, and I know, you know, anybody who's gone to the new county executive town halls knows that we're looking at a significant budget gap. Um, he's, they're looking at it, we're gonna be looking at it, and I think we need to question how we spend money and find out if there's another way. The other thing that I found last night was, um, and it was actually in the 925 mm -hmm. um, meeting that you referenced. Great. If, you're, if the county's average in a certain subject is below the state average, mm -hmm. MSDE provides um, leadership development and school improvement assistance. And specifically it says provide customized professional learning experiences and support informed by data and grounded in effective practices to improve school performance. Right, let me just clarify. So that is for the schools that were identified as comprehensive support. And so uh, when the state released its report card back just prior to the winter break, um, there are schools on a, on a list for comprehensive support. And those are the schools that um, can are first priority for receiving that support. Um, and I certainly am, I would also add that I'm certainly not opposed to collaborating with um, districts. I would say that part of what um, we are asking for is that to analyze air curriculum. So the recommendations for them were based on their curriculum and how their curriculum is designed. I know you and I spoke the other day and we talked about the standards are the same for every district, but every district develops and designs its own curriculum to meet those. And so I'd have to, we'd have to still again look at air curriculum page by page with theirs to see where the recommendations for their curriculum uh, lined up to air curriculum. And is it possible to do that? Um, I, I know when you and I spoke, one of the, the issues was wanting to have something to move forward so that when you have your curriculum writers in during the summer, they can begin to move forward. But given the state of the mathematic performance that we just looked at, I don't think we have the luxury of three and a half years to solve this problem. And I know it's in phases, mm. but I think there needs to be a greater sense of urgency and and a, this is not a, a dig or pointing at you or anybody in this room. I think that we need to, it, it, to me it's a huge emergency. It's, we can't, we it, can't it is, have three, it is so urgent. three I brought more it in years December. like a child in third grade. If we don't have definitive answers, that child is going to be in sixth grade. And when I look at the data that both Dr. Brown um, mm -hmm. presented and the data I looked at last night, it appears that that sixth grade is where kids are really having problems. I don't think we have that luxury. And I also personally don't think we have half a million dollars to spend yeah. um, on a study that we may be able to leverage the findings of another school system, not one for one, but to the extent that we could make positive changes in Baltimore County and drive our results. And, you know, I should point out that I, I'm thrilled for Baltimore County that 50% of their kids are proficient, but that means 50% of their kids aren't, aren't proficient. Correct, right. But in our case, almost 70% of our kids aren't. So, um, I'm sorry, I'll back that up and say um, 60. Sure. So, I mean, those are just mm -hmm. my comments. Mm -hmm. um, I'll open it up to my fellow board members. If, if I may, Ms. Pester, just um, because I, I genuinely, first, I, I certainly respect fiscal responsibility. I, I'm not requesting this to be frivolous. Oh. 
Um, so, I, but I, well, for the record, because I, I think it can easily seem as if people are requesting things for they're not cognizant or not even mindful of that. Um, and yes, it's in phases, and those some of those phases uh, have overlap. Um, and so it's not that no action would be taken till the end of the audit. Let me be clear on that. Um, and when I uh, think about, do we have the capacity and manpower to do this ourselves? If we did, we would have already been doing that. Um, and that that, if you think back to just how Ms. Shea was showing you some of the curriculum and those folders, our central office, I know people often think that central office people are sitting around and, and that there's tons of people. Our math office is primarily resource teachers who are in schools every day directly working with, with teachers. And then our coordinators and the director, my expectation is for them to be out in schools as well, working with department chairs and principals and assistant principals. So we don't have people sitting back who all day. And, and to pull them out of schools, I think, would undercut our, our time with teachers because we, our time with teachers and students in rooms together is really um, precious because it, it's not constant. It's not all year. It's, we really have limited time to get in there when everything is in motion. Um, and then the summertime is really when we can, we can do other work um, that is development and revision. So I just want to share that as a point of understanding, um, not really as a retort, but genuinely, I want you to understand the work that we're doing. I want you to understand why we're requesting uh, that support. And, and ultimately, it is the board's decision. If the board comes back and says, yes, it's urgent, but we're not going to support you in doing it this way, then that's the, dis the board's decision. Um, it, it, we don't have the, the manpower, and I agree, it is urgent. That's why I'm very passionate about it. There's two things that will, uh, you'll see me get fired up, and that is reading and that is math, because at the end of the day, that is our most fundamental core mission. Um, and so forgive my passion, but it quite like, as Ms. Causey said September 25th when she held up the state charts and said, we have work to do, I agree, and I'm trying to get to it. So thank you, Ms. Pasture. I appreciate the opportunity, everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm really about to jump out of this chair. Um, I understand everyone's concern. I, too, um, I'm passionate, no, I'm not passionate about it, but I am concerned about fiscal accountability. I get it. And I've been around long enough at the point at which I retired, I've been around for many, many years. And I recognize, and I love data, I love the numbers and all of that, sat on enough interview panels for administrators where we ask, take a look at the data, tell us how you, what this says to you, how you would fix it. But at the end of the day, whatever it is that any of those people said, the bottom line came back to what other supports are you going to get beyond what you're able to do in your school, recognizing this is what it says and this is what needs to happen. Um, I don't think that Mrs. Mack's question, you're, it's, it really wasn't rhetorical. It, it's a real question. How did we get to this point? And I've been in Baltimore County long enough, and I said it, I've said it before, I've been in long enough to watch enough boards, enough other people in the past who did whatever it is that they did um, to move us forward, and still there were schools of which two, at which two, I was the principal, um, still were underwater because we continued to do uh, we continue to have programs, other people's programs, that we looked at and so, tried to figure out if we could mirror what they did or to talk to them about what it was they did. And in many cases, we tried to do it, and it didn't help. Um, I have um, taken a look, and I, I, there are a whole lot of people in Baltimore County that I love deep in my heart, but they needed to be moved around. So I've seen people, I've called people into my school when I realized that we weren't getting the buying that we needed to get. And I know I understand instruction and curriculum. I get it. So when I call someone from a curriculum office long before any of you, and someone comes in and gives me 
whatever he or she saw as rhyme and reason, but it was not getting to what I needed to have happen in those schools to make a change happen. So I'm happy to see some movement because we need a new way of thinking. So I asked when we first discussed it and folks sat up here, I said, talk to me about, about um, formative assessments and about summative assessments and benchmarks. I threw it all out there. And then when I looked at, okay, let me just bring myself down. I'm sorry, let me just take a breath. Okay, I'm better. And then I looked at what we got from Prince George's County, uh, Montgomery County, and Baltimore City, and all of the things about which I asked were here. I've written curriculum in the English office, yes. So I do get that we hold tightly to those things that we write. We hold tightly to what we think is the big picture. And I do understand that sometimes we need to have some fresh eyes. Um, and so I'm not going to get to the, the, from where the fresh eyes come or how much. I'm just talking about needing fresh eyes to take a look at what we do. Because the reality is we can be in alignment. And certainly anyone in the system can take a look at, at, at what we do and what the state says we should do and say, align, not align, blah, 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 column left, column right, and do that. But if we're in alignment, and it would take idiots to sit at curriculum meetings and not be able to do that. So if we're not making the progress, then clearly that means that there's something beyond that that is wrong. I get it from a school perspective that sometimes when you have buildings that have a lot of new teachers, they might try to follow along with the curriculum but might not see the big picture. They, and, and if, I, I can clearly remember asking a, a curriculum office to pull one of my teachers who's an idiot off of the committee Okay, that's a little strong, but he really was. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Asher. We All love our the, teachers. <laughs> okay, okay, and I love him too, but still, he didn't get it, and it was not working. Why is he on there? So, we want to have a look at what we're doing, yes, beyond just seeing if we're aligned, and as I'm sitting here now looking at the uh, Montgomery County, that those pieces that were of concern are included, that you will get that information, you will get those findings, you will take a look at student samples, you'll get to talk to teachers to find out why teachers chose to do something different beyond. But when we see that as something that's recurring, then you know that there's, there's a problem that needs to be changed. We understand that in the past, when the order, the sequence for the math program shifted based on internal thinking, et cetera, that for many reasons it didn't work, whether it was because of staffing, because it didn't uh, embrace the notion of what happens when there is a vacuum in the middle, and then you have to uh, rethink your staffing because um, the children are going to need some extra supports. We need to have a sweeping um, assessment of what we're doing. Doesn't mean, though, that we can't look at and work with other systems and other people to see some of the things that they did and embrace some of those things in terms of the remedy. But my fear is this. The longer we put this off, the longer we're going to get to the phasing in. Now, I understand that a lot of schools in Baltimore County are doing well, and for a long, long time, they have held up our numbers. But a lot of our schools are not doing well. And I find it egregious, just the thought, that they will be put off any longer because we don't really know, and we never were asked, queried, and I wasn't 
a principal when any of you were here. So it's not about any of you. But we were never asked. We did not talk unless I dragged people into the building and said, I'm not playing. I'm going to put my good local government job on the line, but I'm not playing with you in terms of fixing the ills in our schools. No one ever asked us or said, let's take a look at this. We had to do that inside. And that demoralizes the teachers. It demoralizes the entire staff. I want us to do something now. Now, if we have to process the things that are really getting on our nerves, then just put it on the table. But trying to delay this means that we are delaying good instruction, good possibility for the children who've been underserved for a long time. And all three of us, ironically, are representing districts where we have large numbers of students who have been underserved. So whatever I'm saying, whether it makes any sense or not, I will not, I will not accept a delay for anything other than I can't, even, I can't even finish that sentence. Some, this, uh, there has to be a remedy. If this doesn't pass, then what is the immediate remedy that is going to mean that we are going to start, forget the summer, whatever you have to do, I'm going to trust that in the summer because we will be watching, but that when school opens, all of the children, particularly those who have been disenfranchised for way too long, and I've been in Baltimore County, I was in Baltimore County for a very long time and watched it. I was in Baltimore County at Carver and Sudbrook, so I know the differences. Now is the time for us to act. The people in the system, nice folks, but you're correct. I don't want you, I don't, I don't want you assessing what you already have as your own. I want somebody else, not to say that you're not accomplished, but I want somebody else to take a look at it. I want somebody else to talk to our teachers. If we say on one hand our teachers are afraid to really talk and say all of those things that you, you hear people say, then let somebody from outside ask the teachers what's wrong. Why do you make changes? Do you really know what you're doing when you're making changes? And do we really have administrators in all of our schools that are not doing well, who can do more than just at an interview look at some numbers and say, oh, yeah, well, there's a downward trend there. Heck, Stevie Wonder can tell that, okay, and he's blind. All right, so we understand that there's a downward trend. But what is it we are going to do to fix it? How will the system then support, support those people in the schools to make it happen? And I know this is way too long, but I'm way too passionate about it because I am tired of watching. By zip code, you said it zip code, children being underserved, and I'm tired of looking at a whole bunch of baby teachers and baby administrators who really can't answer the call when the bell is rung. So we don't have any more time. We don't have any more time, because unless somebody has a better way of doing this, the longer we put the this off, the more the same children are going to be underserved. And we'll be sitting here another year, two years, our tenure will be over. And we'll still be looking at the children sitting around like dunderheads. And that's unacceptable, because at the end of the day, when you keep looking at different schools and you don't see any change, I'm sorry, but then the answer becomes, well, maybe it's the children at this school. So maybe it's not just zip code. Maybe it's also race. I'm going to just put it on the table. Hope that it's recorded. Then w that's how we have those, those kinds of conversations that are unacceptable. 
Ms. Pastor, I mean, no disrespect. I just want to say that it is uh, 1253. It's so, okay. I okay. Got it. I just, please, and, and I, likewise, Ms. Mack and Mr. McMillian, I mean, no disrespect. I, I did want to let us. I, know. I would like to. Do you have any comments, Mr. McMillian? I do, but go ahead. No, I, I'm just I, asking. Do you have any? Back to five. I understand, I but I just that's my only question. Do you have any it's comments? All good. <laughs> it's all good. I'm just having a little fun with you. I, I, I want to say I think I understand the importance of an external, independent evaluation of the level of rigor. As a former coach, I know that I did certain things. I needed somebody from the outside to evaluate me. And I understand that piece. I understand the timeliness of making this decision so that we can hire our, our teachers over the summer and we get this work started. My concerns are the $550 price tag. My concern is, if I'm not mistaken, there was one vendor involved in this process. And, and if, in my example, when I talked about me straying, if I strayed, there's other people that strayed too. And we acknowledge that master teachers drift away from the curriculum and, and then the standards is another issue. But I have a concern about the, the level of validity, the, the degree of validity that an outside audit would, would they get an accurate measure of what's going on by the direction that's been chosen. Mm -hmm. if, if we consider that people stray. So, so let me uh, speak to, to a couple of things in, in that regard. Um, first and foremost, uh, there were multiple vendors who applied in the RFP process. This was uh, by far the most complete and, and the best application in the RFP, but there were multiple vendors that that applied and were evaluated by a team of folks who, who looked at that. Um, in terms of, of independence, um, you know, the purpose of an audit is to find gaps. You know, where are there deficits so that we can steer resources and, and, and to try to address that? Um, I think independence in that regard, particularly around the, uh, the level of rigor, is really, really important because this is the shift from what was measured under the old standards to the current standards. You saw that operationalized in a couple items. It is quite a leap. I mean, there's, there's quite a difference between a plug and chug item to the dreaded, you know, um, word problems that we all didn't like when we were kids and the level of, of rigor in these word problems where you have multiple correct answers, multiple step problems, it, it is a vastly different demand characteristic for kids. The vendor in this case um, has done a wonderful job of demonstrating their ability to go into classrooms and make uh, consistent observations of what they see. So if you go back uh, to prior evaluations that they've done, uh, one of the things that they will talk about is the inter-rater reliability, so that if I go into a classroom and I make an observation, what's the likelihood if someone else from the team came in and made that, an observation, would they come up with the same score? Their inter-rater reliability scores are incredibly high, uh, and they actually publish that. And, and I, that, to me, that level of transparency is saying, hey, we, we go to the bother of training people so they, they make independent observations, and we can demonstrate that the observations that they make are consistent and are valid between different observers is something that's incredibly important to me mm -hmm. if we're going to make changes to uh, professional development and or enacted curriculum. So if we see people doing different things in classrooms, we should be documenting it in the same way and making the same inferences about it. Um, again, I, I think Ms. Ms. Shea brought up a good example. Um, I worked uh, at one point in my career as, a, as an editor. Um, and when I was doing my work on my dissertation, even though I knew all that material about what needed to be done in terms of, of a dissertation framework, I hired someone <laughs> to make sure that my dissertation complied with all the academic requirements of my institution. I knew those rules inside and out. I had operationalized them for two years for people's theses and dissertations. There was no way I could apply that to my own work. Take, take this into consideration. Not only are we the authors of the work, but there's been a change in the expectation, the change in the expectation of rigor. And while we may have been well-intended, I think there is a question as to whether or not the curriculum is as rigorous as it needs to be, which I think is a real argument for having someone come in and look at it from the outside. So. Ms. Causey, 
Do you have a comment? Good afternoon. Thank you. I've really enjoyed um, sitting out there and watching this whole time. I appreciate Dr. McComas, the preparation uh, by your team on this issue, and I appreciate the experience that's sitting here um, at this dais with Ms. Pasteur and Mr. McMillian and Ms. Mack. I um, new to the board this year is the opportunity for any board member to contribute to committees. Um, and I just wanted to, if it's okay with Ms. Mack, to make a suggestion in the interest of time and in the interest of so much that you all have discussed today. So if that's... I'm amenable to a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that this committee could consider is to recommend to the full board that they accept this contract uh, with the staff bringing it out for one year of defined funding and then evaluate it at six months or eight months down the road to modify to extend the funding for additional years if in fact this process is bringing value if this uh, program is really helping the school system because there is a sense of urgency and i did on september 25th as you said yes you did two said, hours and 15 minutes into the meeting we had <laughs> we have a lot of work to do and as Ms. pasture pointed out there are inequities across the system and we need to do more to figure out why that is. We need to do more, no matter why that is, to support those students. And we also have to do more to make sure that our students at all spectrums of ability are achieving their potential. So that's something that I would suggest uh, the board could, this committee could recommend to the full board to have staff bring to the next full board meeting a contract with one year of um, funding for, for this contract. That would also allow the board to have, uh, be concerned about fiscal responsibility in the budget cycles coming forward because we don't know yet how much money we're getting. And my understanding would be that this line item is um, the money can come out of this year's budget for this first year. Is that correct? So uh, the funding for uh, this evaluation would not require an additional ask of the, the, the board. Okay. Uh, all of this would be part of our normal operating funds. Okay, so that's a suggestion that I would make. I, uh, one, one caveat on, on that, um, Ms. Kazi, as you're well aware, the, the board gives funding authority, um, but that doesn't mean that we have to, to spend that. Um, so the evaluation as it's laid out currently is laid out in phases for a reason. And you have a copy of that in your folder. It's this chart, so you can sort of see the overlap yeah. of different parts of the so it's process. So it's laid out in phases for a reason. Um, and, and I would argue that you know, if upon independent evaluation of the curriculum and the alignment of the curriculum, it's found that we need to make sub substantial uh, changes to the curriculum, then it doesn't make as much sense to do uh, observations of an enacted curriculum until those changes have been made and put in place. Uh, that's when then the, the, the observation of the enacted curriculum becomes pretty important. So there's some natural breaks in this process that make sense to look at um, without necessarily having to go back and ask for funding each year. And I would need to go back to purchasing to see whether or not um, that would work within the framework of the proposal or would we simply um, discontinue at, at a later point in time. I would just like to say I appreciate, uh, I, I know everyone at this dais is passionate about this. I appreciate everyone understanding the urgency. I appreciate um, recognizing that if we had the capacity to do this ourselves within the math office, we already would have done that. Um, and so thank you, Ms. Causey, for your um, suggestion to your board colleagues. So do I have a motion to um, adopt the recommendation made by Ms. Causey to um, bring back to the board a process whereby we approve, um, propose an approval of one year and then fund the rest of it based on the outcome of that year? I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Okay. So um, the motion carries in. Ms. Cox, do you have the vote? Yeah, uh, Miss, 
Uh, Ms. Mack, I believe you need to say all in favor and actually. Oh, all in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kazi. Certainly. Okay. Um, not really. If there's no other business, I would move to adjourn this meeting. I would like to say I appreciate everybody's efforts. Um, it was very enlightening for me, and um, I look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.